Wonderful. Welcome back, everybody. So today we're going to be talking about uh, or continuing our discussion about one qubit quantum computing. And what we're working towards in this part of the, the course is our full proof of universality. But of course, we're going to begin by talking about single qubit quantum computing. So uh, let me just share my screen. Wonderful. OK. So the basic idea, just to remind you of what the computational model will end up looking like for one qubit QC, is that we're allowed to do a number of different things. The first thing is we can prepare the state zero. Okay, so without uh, this is needed so that way our, our quantum computer has some an, a, a uni uniform initial configuration. And we're gonna just define this initial configuration to be the zero state, which if you recall in column vector notation, for those of you who haven't, you know, become fully comfortable with Dirac notation is just this vector over here, okay? Now, the next thing that we can do is we can do operations on this. So we can apply operations in the set identity x, y, z, and then the uh, Hadamard operation and the S operation, as well as some other operations. Well, the first one of these is the T gate, um, the RZ operation, and RX operation. Now, these gates over here are kind of special compared to these operations. These ones are known as the Clifford gates. And these end up forming a finite group. So it turns out that if we multiply these different gates together, then we um, only can end up actually producing a finite number of quantum states. Whereas these non-Clifford operations, it turns out that if we combine any of these, with the Clifford operations, then together, these two are going to end up forming a universal set of gate operations. But we'll get to that in a bit. So the first thing that I wanted to say is, just say is okay, well, how does this actually work in practice? So we begin, let's say my algorithm that I wanna perform is, my algorithm is as follows. What I wanna do is I want to, step one, prepare, zero. Step two, apply um, H, three, apply Z, and four, apply H. This transformation um, uh, as a sequence of gate operations uh, uh, can be written as H, Z, H acting on zero, where this is step one, this is step two, three, and step four in here. Now, note that this is unfortunately in the exact opposite order of what we would like you know, for time ordering. Often we'd like time ordering from left to right. Unfortunately, matrix multiplication was defined to kind of go more from right to left. So that's the reason why when you're reading out a sequence of operations you wanna do one after another in quantum computing, those uh, operations are given right to left, not left to right, just because of the fact of the, the conventions that we chose when matrix multiplication was defined. So these are the operations that we're allowed. And there's a third thing that we can do, which of course is measure. And so what measurement ends up doing is it ends up um, giving us a value that's either zero or one, with the probability uh, given by x psi absolute value squared. So as a particular example, let's um, take a look at uh, what this would end up looking like. So if psi is equal to, I don't know, um, one over four plus one, um, 
or no, you know what? Let's just make it one over root two, one over root two. There we go. At least I know how to do, deal with this reliably. <laughs> so in any case, the probability of zero for this guy is again, just the absolute value of zero interproducted with psi squared. And that is this component up here, which is one half. And similarly, the probability of one would be one half for that. Now, when we're going through and um, uh, in order to go through and do these operations in this sequence over here though, and compute the probability of some sort of a measurement in the end, I'll, I'll, what I need to do is I need to go through and explain what specifically each of these operations ends up doing. And so this uh, discussion of this, as well as the, the important properties of these gate operations is really what we're going to use, uh, take up in the majority of the rest of the time in this lecture. So the first operations that I wanna be able to discuss are the Pauli operations. Now these operations are named after Wolfgang Pauli, one of the founding fathers of uh, quantum computing or not meant indirectly quantum computing, I meant quantum mechanics. So the Pauli operations are uh, defined as follows. X is 0, 1, 1, 0. This is equal to the not gate, uh, if you recall from reversible quantum uh, uh, classical computing. We next have the Y gate, which is defined to be negative I, I, 0. And the Z gate is defined to be one minus one, zero, zero. All right, so these are the Pauli operations and Pauli operations have a bunch of really beautiful properties. This is one of the reasons why they show up over and over again in our descriptions of, of computing, um, as well as in our descriptions of nature for that matter. But the first property of uh, Pauli operations is that these operations are what we call uh, Hermitian. So X is equal to X dagger. Now, if you recall what the dagger operation is, this is a complex transpose or a Hermitian transpose. And the idea basically is that what you do is you take the transpose of the matrix and compute its complex conjugate. So for example, X dagger is just defined to be 0, 1, 1, 0, transpose, and then complex conjugated. This is, of course, equal to the complex conjugate of the transpose of the not operation, which, and the transpose just switches the rows and the columns. So you can see that it ends up forming this, and that's equal to x. So this is um, uh, x equals x dagger. OK, cool. Now, we could also see the same thing with y y is actually also equal to y dagger. And this uh, is a little less uh, obvious, but let's actually just do it all out. So y dagger is the following, transpose, then an element-wise complex conjugate is applied. So this is equal to, first, the transpose, which switches the rows and the columns. So the first row becomes the first column, and the second row, becomes the second column. And then we take the element-wise complex conjugate. Remember, the complex conjugate of i is equal to minus i. So this ends up being 0 minus i um, minus, um, minus i, 0, which is just equal to y. So you can end up seeing that y equals y dagger and x equals x dagger. Uh, similarly, z equals z dagger, even more trivially. So these operations are known as Hermitian matrices. So a, a, ma a matrix is Hermitian if and only if we end up having that x, that a is equal to a dagger. Okay, the next property about Pauli operations is Pauli operations are unitary. Okay, and again, what, did, what was the definition of unitary matrices? A matrix is unitary if and only if A 
dagger is equal to A inverse. Okay, and so now let's just take a look at uh, uh, the poly operations. We have that X, X dagger. If X is unitary, then this has to be equal to X, X inverse. Or in other words, this has to be identity. However, X is Hermitian. Since X is Hermitian, then X dagger is equal to X. Therefore, we end up having that for Hermitian matrices, we require that X squared is equal to identity. Let's take a look at the knot gate again. The knot gate is of the form 0, 1, 1, 0. And so if we square this, squaring it implies that X squared is equal to 1, 0, 0, 1 which is the identity matrix. Again, it's called the identity matrix because if we act on the state, uh, any state A, B in here, this, the matrix product between these will end up giving us just A, B back. So therefore, this matrix doesn't do anything to an input vector. And so hence we call it the identity um, uh, matrix. Now, the next uh, operation that we add, we'd like to do, similarly, we can end up seeing that y squared equals identity equals z squared. So all poly operations are then both unitary and Hermitian. Now, this is a, a little bit of jargon at first, but with, there's so many beautiful properties to both of these types of matrices that we're going to be using and taking advantage of these properties going forward. So this, uh, these are the, um, the, some of the basic properties of poly operations. The next property that's really important to know about poly operations is that uh, we have that xy is equal to minus yx. Similarly, um, xz is equal to minus zx, and um, zy is equal to minus yz. So basically, this property is known as anti-commutation. In other words, we, we say two operators or two matrices anti-commute if and only if x, uh, for the, the two of them, that if a, b plus b, a equals zero, then they anti-commute. Of course, uh, there's another piece of jargon, which uh, will come up later, but not so much here is two operations are said to commute, on the other hand, if AB is equal to minus B, uh, or is equal to BA. So in this case, the order in which you end up applying two gates kind of doesn't matter. Whereas if they anti-commute, then it really matters the order that you end up applying them. Okay, so those are, that's the anti-commutation property of poly operations. The next one is actually something really kind of cool. It's that X times Y is equal to I times Z. And Y times Z is equal to I times X. And similarly, Z times X is equal to I times Y. So you end up seeing that there's this property where if you multiply two different poly operators, you end up getting the third one, but with a i multiplied by it in front. Okay, so this is uh, this is a again a very useful property that we end up having for poly operators. The next thing that I wanted to uh, describe about poly operations is actually that poly operations form a operator basis.
Uh, specifically, what I mean is that for any matrix, for all matrix M, call it in C two by two, there exists um, constants alpha, beta, gamma, delta, such that M is equal to alpha identity um, plus beta X plus gamma Y plus delta Z, all right? And in, in practice, actually, you can end up figuring out what these constants actually are. And the way that you, you can do that is just by uh, uh, using the fact that we can, the inner pro, the, that you can define an inner product for the poly operations. In particular, the inner product between two matrices um, can be defined as follows. The inner product between A and matrix A and matrix B is defined where these two are in C2 by two in both cases, is then one half the trace of A times B, where um, the trace of the matrix A, B, C, D is just equal to the sum of the diagonal elements. So this is just A plus D, okay? So that's how we can end up computing the inner product. And similarly, just like we would with an operator basis, we can end up finding before M is equal to alpha I plus beta uh, X plus gamma Y plus delta Z, we end up having that alpha is equal to the inner product of, um, of the matrix um, M with identity, which is equal to one half the trace of M identity, which of course is equal to just one half the trace of M. Similarly, beta is equal to the inner product between the matrix that we want to represent and the poly X operation, which is just equal to one half the trace of M times X. Okay, and so that is that. Is that. But just to, to give you an idea about why exactly this ends up working like a valid inner product, um, we need to know that all of these operations or all of these basis vectors, I say vectors loosely because they're now matrices, but we're treating them as if they're no different from vectors. All of these different basis elements uh, are orthonormal. So to give you an example, let's take a look at the inner product between uh, X and um, identity. Okay, this is equal to one half the trace of X, which is this. Now you can see that the diagonal elements of this matrix are zero. So therefore this is equal to zero. Now let's take a look at the inner product between, I don't know, say X and Y. Well, the inner product between X and Y is one half the trace of X times Y. Okay, that's cool. But this, it turns out that trace has a pro nice property. The order of the, of a pro of, that you use for a trace of the product of two matrices doesn't matter. So the trace of A times B happens to be equal to the trace of B times A. So this is equal to one half, also equal to the trace of Y times X. Now, if we recall trace of Y times X also using this property up here is, is equal to minus the trace of X, Y. So if we go back over here, this is also equal to minus one half the trace of X, Y. And this leads to a contradiction the con uh, because we have to have that this is equal to minus that. And the only way that this can be true is that if both of them are equal to zero. So we, can en we end up seeing that the 
inner product using similar arguments between any two poly operations is zero, unless possibly those two poly operations are equal. And so you can see the inner product between X and X, for example, is equal to one half the trace of X times X. And of course, because of this property back over here, that X uh, squared equals Y squared equals the identity, we have that one half trace X squared is one half times the trace of the identity matrix. The identity matrix is just equal to one, zero, zero, one. So therefore the trace of this is two. So this is equal to two over two is equal to one. So therefore these are orthonormal. If we end up writing the uh, poly uh, uh, operations in the following form, if we say that P um, zero is equal to identity, P um, one is equal to X, P two is equal to Y and P three is equal to Z. Then using this language, the inner product of PI and PJ is equal to Delta IJ. So we could end up seeing that they, they end up forming an orthonormal operator basis. And so can be used in order to be able to represent darn near anything. So this is really useful because of the fact that it allows us to always write a matrix as a sum of poly operators. And that can be useful because poly operators are stupidly easy to manipulate because they have all of these nice features. And we'll be using some of these features later on. So this is everything you ever wanted to know about polys, but we're afraid to ask. Let's move on to the next operations. The next operations that we want to, um, uh, that we need to discuss is the Hadamard gate. Now the Hadamard gate is, is a really interesting gate. The Hadamard gate takes the following form. H is equal to one over root two. 1, 1, 1, minus 1. Okay, and what does it do? Well, let's just get an idea about it. So if we look at its action on 1, 0, which is equal to the all 0 input, this is just equal to 1 over root 2, first row times the first column, plus the second row times the first column, because there's only one column. Um, this ends up giving us 1, 1, which again in Dirac notation is 1 over root 2, zero plus one. There, there we go. Now, similarly, H acting on zero one, uh, whoops, sorry, is equal to one over root two, one minus one, which is equal to one over root two, zero minus one. Okay, so why, why is this so cool? Well, this is really cool because Hadamard ends up mapping zero to a state that is 50% zero and 50% one. So the way I like thinking about it is it's kind of like a quantum coin flip, okay? We start in a definite state, we apply the Hadamard gate, and then right afterwards, we now have an equal outcome. The, however, there's a difference between this and the actual, an actual coin flip. And that key difference is the following, that H squared is actually equal to identity, meaning that Hadamard is also Hermitian and unitary. So to see that H squared is equal to identity, we can just actually go through and do the matrix multiplication. We have h squared is just equal to 1 half, 1, 1, 1, minus 1, times 1, 1, 1, minus 1. Cool. So we multiply these two together, and we get 1 over 2, uh, 2. This times the, the, the second column is equal to 0. We get a 0 and a 2, which is equal to identity. So therefore, it squares to identity, So it, uh, and it is... Um, equal to its conjugate transpose, i.e. specifically 
h is equal to h dagger, because if we take its transpose, we get the same result. So that is, um, that ends up showing that uh, h has had a uh, Hermitian and unitary. So this shows something kind of cool though. Like ordinarily, if you flipped a coin twice, right, you would have a 50-50 probability distribution of heads or tails. But if we do a quantum flip twice, that corresponds to applying Hadamard and then a Hadamard on some initial state, let's say it's zero. This ends up giving us, well, um, zero back again. But I'll go through the calculation um, just in order to give a little bit of intuition for something that'll come later. So if we go through the calculation, we end up getting that this is same as Hadamard times one over root two, zero plus one. Now, Hadamard acting on zero gives us um, one over root two, zero plus one, plus one half, zero minus one. Combining these two together, we end up getting zero, just like we, we saw on the top line. But what ended up happening here? Well, what ended up happening is that the first branch had a probability of being in one of one of one half. The second one kind of had an amplitude of being in one of um, negative one half. And these two amplitudes canceled, leaving only the zero possibility. So in other words, the possibility, the potential of the state being in one in, given both configurations canceled, at leaving us only with the possibility that's in zero. And this cause, uh, this is why, or a way you could understand why with a quantum coin, if we flipped it using this Hadamard operation, that the second flip actually will end up returning us back to where we started. So if we flip a quantum coin twice, then we'll always get back to heads if we started in heads. However, if we flipped it once, we'd have a 50-50 distribution. So the moral of the story is never trust a quantum coin flipper. <laughs> and we'll see once we cover amplitude amplification that there's even more deadly things that they can do if, uh, <laughs> if they have the full, a full quantum power to manipulate a quantum coin. So that is uh, um, how things end up working with us. Um, the, Next thing that I wanted that I wanted to show um, regarding this is that the Hadamard transform also has some very very nice properties um, involving poly operators. So the the most important property is that Hadamard Z Hadamard is equal to X. So we can use this in order to interchange between the Z operation, which if you recall is one minus one zero and the not gate over here which is given by zero one one zero okay so this is like point two now point three is well the converse if we sandwich again every hadamards around the outside we have hadamard z hadamard hadamard is equal to hadamard x hadamard well, because H is Hermitian and unitary, these cancel. And so similarly, the Hadamard left and right multiplying the Z gate ends up giving us the X gate. So if we go back to, for, for, to our, the circuit that we did earlier, or we talked about earlier, where we talked about applying H, Z, H to zero, Using this identity, we can see that this is exactly the same thing as applying a not gate to zero, which will deterministically end up giving us one. And so these identities can give us fast ways of computing common uh, operators like this pattern, this HZH pattern that you see over here. Whereas if you didn't know these properties, you'd have to go and do all of the matrix multiplications to validate that the, the action of these three operations on the zero state will end up giving us one. All right, so 
that is uh, the the uh, an, a very nice property that we have for this. Let me now um, talk about the um, S gate. So the S gate is actually defined to be the square root of the Z gate. And the S gate has a similar property. It could actually be used to transform the X into the Y gate. And that's one of the main reasons where Y S ends up getting a lot of play. The property that we end up having for this, let's call it four, is that S X S dagger is equal to Y. Now we can see this just by uh, multiplication. So first S is equal to the square root of one, zero, zero, minus one, which uh, for diagonal matrix, we can compute the uh, square root of a diagonal matrix by taking the square root of its elements. So only for a diagonal matrix, the square root is one, zero, I over here. So we end up finding that one, zero, zero, I acting on zero, one, one, zero, one, zero, zero minus I over here. Uh, multiplying it through, we end up getting that this is uh, zero, one, I, zero, multiplied by one, zero minus I, which of course ends up giving us zero minus I, I, zero, which we've previously defined to be equal to the Y matrix. So at the phase gate, allows us to interconvert between the two. And similarly, we end up having that the Y gate can be built using S and Hadamard from the Z gate. So S uh, H Z H S dagger is equal to Y. Okay, cool. So these are our, um, our uh, a commonly used set of discrete uh, quantum uh, operations on a single quantum bit. The next operation I wanted to find, and I'm not going to talk about too many of its properties, um, but it's actually in many ways more vital than almost any of the operations I've talked about before, is the T-gate, which is equal to the square root of S, which is equal to the fourth root of Z. And the T-gate over here is just equal to, you guessed it, one, zero, square root i. And if you're wondering what square root i is, well, square root i can be written as 0, 0, e to the i pi by 4, where e to the i theta is equal to cos theta plus i sine theta. OK, so that is the t-gate. Um, We'll need it a lot when we discuss about universality of single uh, uh, of a discrete gate set. But for now, we can just leave the T gate somewhat undefined. The last two operations that I want to uh, discuss are the operations R z of theta and R x of theta. R z of theta is defined to be e to the minus i z theta divided by two. Okay, and unfortunately, the divide by two ends up coming about because of some conventions relating um, rotations to um, uh, to ordinary rotations in O3. So these are it's a way of relating these operations in the single qubit space to operations in higher uh, in uh, to rotations in for ordinary objects in three dimensions. So this is RZ of theta. Now there's a couple of different properties for RZ of theta. The coolest one is uh, RZ of theta, of course, it takes an arbitrary angle theta as input. So RZ, unlike the previous ones, takes a classically provided real parameter over here and maps it to a particular complex two by two matrix. And the definition of RZ is uh, given by e to the minus i z theta over two. Now, this is a matrix exponential. And for all matrix exponentials in this course, we define them using the Taylor series expansion. So this is defined to be minus i z theta over two to the j over j factorial. Now, 
using this uh, the Taylor series expansion of this and the fact that Z squared is equal to identity, we can end up seeing that this over here has the exact same Taylor series as cosine theta over two minus I sine theta over two poly Z. And the reason why this has that property is that for any term that has an even number of Zs, because Z squared is equal to identity, we also have that Z to the fourth is equal to identity. And collecting all of those terms, we end up getting that the identity terms can be grouped together as this cosine expansion. Now, on the other hand, Z uh, cubed is equal to Z times Z squared, which is equal to Z. So we can end up seeing that the odd powers of poly Z will end up leaving a factor of Z left over in the end. And this is the collection of all of the odd uh, examples. And so this uh, uh, is the expression that we end up having. And when we group this, we end up getting, this is cosine theta over two minus I sine theta over two, zero, zero, uh, cosine theta over two plus I sine theta over two, okay? Which of course is equal to E to the minus I theta over two, zero, zero, E to the I theta over two. Okay, cool. And this is actually very different from what you would get just by element wise exponentiating Z. If we element wise exponentiated Z, this is wrong. Um, this would end up going, and I'll put a theta here and a minus I, then this would end up going to uh, what? It would end up going to um, e to the negative I theta over here. Um, then this is zero over here. So we'd have one, one e to the I theta. And we see that this is this isn't unitary. This isn't this is all sorts of wrong because it doesn't maintain the length of vectors when you apply it. So we never want to exponentiate matrices in an element wise way. Instead, we exponentiate matrices in this context by using this Taylor series definition. Similarly, by going through the exact same sort of reasoning with Rx, uh, which again maps the reals to C2 by 2, we have that Rx of theta is equal to cosine um, theta over 2 identity minus I sine theta over 2 x, which is equal to um, cosine theta over 2 um, minus I sine theta over two minus I sine theta over two cosine theta over two, okay? And these two operations have a couple of nice properties on top of these. One of the really nice properties that um, I wanted to mention is the following. So, the first property is that if we have Rz of theta times Rz of phi, this is equal to Rz of theta plus phi. So just like rotations that you would normally end up picturing, right? If we had a rotation that starts off, you know, um, in a particular state, then what these rotations end up doing is they'll take that vector and rotate it up about a particular axis, right? So this uh, we, can we can think about as being a rotation about the z-axis through an angle of theta. Now, if we have two rotations that rotate about the z-axis through an angle of theta and phi, which is what these two end up doing, then they create a total rotation angle of theta plus phi. So that's one of the beautiful properties of single qubit rotations that makes them very useful, is that when you apply two of them, their arguments add. All right, the next, and which is something we're gonna be exploring um, next lecture, 
is that uh, for all unitary matrices U, there exists alpha, beta, gamma, and delta such that U is equal to E to the I alpha R uh, Z of um, beta R X of gamma R Z of delta. All right, so this ends up saying that any unitary matrix can actually be decomposed only into Z, X, and uh, Z and X gates with this extra phase factor put in front of it. And so this, in essence, ends up saying that these two um, continuous rotation gates, R, R, Z, um, and R, X alone, are universal for one qubit quantum computing because we can use them in order to be able to build an arbitrary two by two unitary matrix. The very last thing that I wanna talk about is of course, measurement. So one of the things that was very important is that measurement in probabilistic reversible computing we have that measurement ended up commuting with all of our operations. So for example, if we ended up having something that ended up looking like this, we have a probability distribution coming in, P, we apply a not gate, and then we measure the result. What we would end up having is that if our probability distribution was A and B, then the not gate will flip that to B and A. And then the measurement will end up giving us um, zero with probability B. Okay, now on the other hand, let's say that we began by measuring and then applied a knock gate. Well, what would we end up getting in uh, uh, the final output? Well, the first measurement will end up giving us zero with probability um, A, and it will give us one with probability B. Now we apply the not gate, and this will end up flipping the two roles. And so this will end up now giving us one with probability B and zero, uh, or sorry, uh, one with probability A and zero with probability B which is exactly what we ended up seeing up here. So measurement commutes with gate operations for one qubit reversible um, uh, computing. However, that isn't true at all for quantum. So to give you an idea about this, let's begin with the following transformations. We prepare a quantum state in zero we are now going to apply a Hadamard, a Hadamard, and we're going to measure. The resulting state that we'll end up getting back out in this particular case will, will be the state zero with probability one, because these two cancel. They fuse to make the identity operation because H squared is identity. All right, cool. Now let's flip this around. Let's apply a Hadamard and then we measure and then we apply a Hadamard. Well, the Hadamard and the measure, this will end up going to a state um, zero with probability one half and one with probability one half. This is right up until we, well, as soon as we've done the measurement. So we apply the Hadamard gate on zero, then we measure it. And as we said repeatedly, the Hadamard gate applied to zero has a 50-50 probability of zero and one. So that's all I've discussed here. Now we apply the Hadamard gate. In both the zero and the one case, the Hadamard gate will now map us to one over root two, zero plus one with probability one half. And in this case, it'll map us to one over root two, zero minus one with probability one half. 
So you can see that these two probability distributions are radically different. The order of when you do a gate and when you do a measurement actually is really important. And this makes measurement an active participant in quantum computing rather than a passive one. But why? Why is it that these two operations have such radical differences? Well, in part, this is all going back to this calculation uh, uh, that I ended up doing uh, previously. So we ended up showing, I think this is it. Yes, this ca uh, calculation. What we showed is we showed that if h squared is equal to zero, and the reason why h squared was equal to zero is because the possibility or the probability amplitude that the quantum bit was in one canceled the probability amplitude that it was in one from the other branch. So to view this diagrammatically, we have two possibilities. It starts in zero. The Hadamard kind of ends up creating this branch or a decision where the quantum state is allowed to be in uh, a mixture of both zero and one. Now, what ends up happening is we apply the Hadamard gate again. The Hadamard transform ends up allowing, okay, this goes to say zero and this goes to one. Now we apply the Hadamard gate again and Hadamard gate will allow us to stay in one with some possibility then transition up to zero with some possible probability. And then we have these two. What ends up happening is that the transition from one to one, this gets a minus sign. However, all the rest of these are positive. And so the minus sign graphically ends up canceling. But when we measure this, what happens is the measurement ends up giving us this or that. Now, because of the fact that these are just two disjoint possibilities, we don't end up in a situation when we do the measurement where these amplitudes can recombine in order to interfere. And this is why the order of measurement really, really matters for quantum computing, because measurement destroys information or extracts information from a system. And that information you extract can remove these possibilities or these probability amplitudes that can interfere with each other. So this is why you have to be really careful about how you use measurement in quantum computing, because if you use it in the wrong way, it can remove the very interference patterns that we'll see will be absolutely vital for us getting quantum advantage in algorithms like uh, search or others. So, okay, well, that's it. Thank you very much. And um, yes, yeah, stay tuned for the next lecture where we'll begin by showing how we can use RZ and RX in order to implement an arbitrary single qubit rotation. Thank you.